Welcome to Jungit's Games. Today, I have finally decided that it's time for me to cover my top 10 list for the games that I played that came out in 2018. Now, when I did the research for this, it looks like that was 105 different games, and I've now spent the last couple weeks calling that list down and swapping some things around, and at this point, I'm feeling pretty happy with it. Now, you can uh, feel free to skip ahead to the slot that you are most interested in. Obviously, I've decided to keep things a bit of a mystery by not putting the names over here, but if you would like to see the full list, you can check it out in the description down below. Now, before we jump into this list, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, you please consider clicking the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that, including voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the list. Let's go ahead and start with game number 10, and this one is Pandoria. Now, this one came out at Essen Spiel last year, and I was lucky enough to attend, and I pre-ordered a copy of this game and picked it up there. Now, what's going on in this game is each player starts off with a asymmetric race, and many of them are kind of standard fantasy tropes. You have elves, uh, halflings, and uh, dwarves, and that kind of thing. But the way these uh, different races play is somewhat significant. And then, when it comes to the actual way that you play this game, there's some pretty strange stuff that I really enjoyed in the two plays of this game that I've had so far. Now, the basic structure of this game is every turn, you're going to place down a tile onto a public board, and that tile is essentially two hexagons stuck together with two different types of terrain. Now, after you put that tile down, you will then have the option of putting one of your workers down on top of that tile, and then this really interesting thing happens where if you look out to the board, if you by putting that tile down, you have now completely enclosed a contiguous area of a terrain type, then that terrain type will score at the end of the round, and before that even happens, Happens, you kick off all of the workers from that uh, enclosed terrain type. Now, when the scoring happens, every person is going to get one of that resource for each one of their workers that is adjacent to the score region and uh, for every resource that is within that score region. So if there are three coins in that region and you have two workers next to it, then that would be three times two or you would get six coins. Now, everyone gets to score it even though it's your turn and you put the tile down, you might put yourself into a situation where multiple people will get stuff and there are effectively three resources in this game. You have gems that you can use to cast spells, you have money that lets you buy cards, and you have wood that lets you build buildings. Now these cards can be used as either a spell or as a building, and the spells are effectively one-shot actions that let you do a variety of cool things, and the buildings instead you get to slide under your tableau, and they give you an ongoing uh, effect that might bend the rules for you. Now that is the general structure of the game, but the reason that I've been really, um, I found the game quite compelling has to do with the way that players are working against each other, but also with with each other to try and kind of build out these areas while you're trying to squeak out advantages for yourself. And also, the way you score points in this game is... <laughs> It just feels a little bit different than what you would normally expect from a game like this. Uh, you get almost all of your points while you are playing, and when you get resources, you track them on a player board in front of yourself, and you can't store more than 10 of each resource um, at any point in time. Now, the thing is, for every three additional of a resource that you generate with one of these scoring actions, you get a point, and there are buildings that you can build that will uh, change that modifier for you. It might become a 2 to 1 or a 3 to 2 or something like that. So this game really turns into this interesting affair where you're trying to generate the resources that you need to cast the spells and uh, buy cards and build buildings, but you are trying to build up to a couple times in the game having a humongous scoring. Now, there are buildings that let you add uh, uh, effectively resources to the scoring modifiers, and you are trying to get yourself in a situation where you might get 40 wood with one scoring. Now, obviously, you cannot store 40 wood, so maybe you store like five or six of it, and then the rest of it you uh, run through your multiplier, which hopefully, if you've been building towards getting 40 wood, you also have a building that makes you maybe a two to one, and then you two to one on the you know 34 remaining uh, resources, and right there you get 17 victory points, and you tr uh, score that on the board. Now this is a big way that you get points in the game, trying to work towards these combos. But of course everybody is trying to do that, and you're trying to mitigate um, the combos that your opponents can do, and also you're trying to um, work it so that your workers can score multiple times. But of course when an area gets enclosed with a worker on it, those workers get removed from the board. So you are uh, just trying to be as efficient as possible in this expanded. Uh, communal uh, tiling space that scores in a really peculiar way, and all of these reasons are um, the reason why this game is on this list. Uh, sure, it's number 10, but you know, just being on this list means it's uh, within the top 10% uh, of the games that I played in, uh, or that came out in 2018, and I really feel like the uh, decisions that you make and just the way that you talk to your opponents and you try to get into their minds about what they're going to do is really fascinating, and then I also love the fact that you just draw a, a tile at the end of your turn, and then you must 
play it down at the beginning of your next turn. So you don't have a huge hand of cards, uh, or tiles anyway, to place down. You have that one thing and you have to decide how best to use it. Now you do have a hand of cards in this game and it's also wonderful deciding, do I want to play this card as a spell to do that one-shot effect that might do some really awesome things for me right now? Or do I want to slide it in as a building to give me an ongoing uh, beneficial effect that maybe is more situational? So there's just all of these really cool things to think about. And then to circle back to what I said at the very beginning, you have these asymmetries, which are really wonderful. Um, they can definitely affect how you'll play from one game to the next. And I will admit that uh, when I picked this one up at Essen, it came with some promos. Uh, I'm not sure. I didn't do my research, I guess, to see exactly how many came with the base box and how many came as promos that you can probably get uh, later on. But I do know that I have more uh, of the different races in the box that I have than um, many of the retail, retail versions of this game will have. But I will also say that the variety of the effects that, that happen in here are really cool. Uh, the last time I played this one, I did play one of those promo characters, and their asymmetric effect was that um, when I actually uh, uh, removed people from the board by enclosing regions, I took them prisoner, and I actually took people's workers prisoner and put them on my player board, and then they had to essentially pay me off to pull these off, and when they take their uh, people back, then I got resources that I needed, and at the end of the game, if I had any people in my area, then I got extra points for them. Um, and that really affected how this entire game played. Um, I'd played it before, where there was no wacky prisoner mechanism, and um, what that meant was, you know, people had this diminishing, diminishing worker pool as I collected more and more of other people until they finally decided it was worth it to actually pay me off. I just really enjoyed how that one particular character played, but I've also enjoyed seeing how the rest of the different asymmetric abilities played. So I think that's going to wrap up uh, my, my thoughts for the moment on uh, Pandoria. I think it's got some really great decisions. It has a really cool uh, turn structure. It's got a, a very interesting uh, way of having the players play off of each other, trying to build up really big combos, and I am certainly looking forward to playing this one more. Next up, we have game number nine, and this one is Manara. Now, this game came out about the middle way through of 2018, and this is a fully cooperative stacking dexterity style game. Now, the way the game works is when it is your turn, you have to decide uh, to flip over a easy, medium, or hard challenge for that turn. You flip it over, and then it will tell you what you have to do. Now, usually this involves taking these uh, long, skinny cylinders from your personal supply and putting them up, uh, standing end up, uh, somewhere in the middle of the player area. Now, sometimes there are some funky challenges that might actually have you moving these cylinders around, but the way the game works is as soon as any of these really strange and interestingly shaped pieces of cardboard on the table are full up where they have the matching color cylinders on top of their colored spots on the cardboard, that is the moment you have to bring in a new piece of cardboard and stack it up somewhere on your uh, tower that you are constructing. Now, you're going to keep playing this game until... Well, the tower falls over, or uh, until some uh, we run out of the cylinders, or until you run out of the missions that you are actually trying to play through. I think you also finish the game if you get all of the uh, uh, floor tiles out into your tower. And so the way it works is you just need to be in a winning situation the moment the end game happens. Now, you are in a winning situation if you have the correct number of uh, floors or higher based off of the uh, current difficulty of the moment that you're really in. At the start of the game, you choose a difficulty and that will tell you how many floors you need as a base. But as you're playing the game, if you ever uh, draw one of those challenges that you cannot satisfy, then you actually put it face down into the difficulty area. And that's one more row, one more uh, floor up that you need to have constructed when the game actually ends in order to win. Now, also, you can build out the base to put more uh, down so you can go kind of wider. But every time you build out a new piece onto the table, you add one again to the difficulty. Now, what this means is, as you are playing this dexterity game, you are having pretty intense and wonderful discussions with your teammates around the table, because you might talk about which one of the difficulties you should do, and then you'll flip it over, and then well, you have to just figure it out. Like, we should put this here and there, and that'll unlock this ability. And maybe, I don't know, maybe we should do that because this isn't a really good position for this uh, tower board. Maybe we should do this other thing. There's just quite a bit of discussion that happens. But then, uh, once you know a decision is made as to how that turn is going to happen, then it's that person's turn to do the plan. They have to execute it. It's a dexterity game, and that means that this is certainly not a cooperative game where you could have an alpha player uh, where somebody just, you know, essentially plays the entire game for themselves, because in this case, every single person has to do these things, and sometimes it's quite challenging. Uh, like I said, uh, there are many that cause you to uh, have to pull these cylinders out from the bottom and put them up on the top, so you have this amazing moment where you're just like uh, telling everybody to get away from the table, and you're trying to extract this cylinder, and everything's kind of wobbling as you're trying to put this thing together, and it's just 
it's just wonderful when you actually pull those moments off, especially considering it's cooperative, so everybody is so elated when you do a really complicated move to get it done. Now, uh, I, I do want to mention that when the game, when the tower falls over, that effectively instigates the end of the game. And according to the rules, if you at that moment have, um, uh, are matching the uh, difficulty level, then you can actually win with the tower falling over. But I have instituted, when we played it, a house rule to say that if, if anything falls over, then, then you just lose. Because because uh, without that house rule, you could kind of game it and knock parts of it over while other parts are staying uh, uh, tall enough to actually match up with the victory condition. And that just kind of feels like it's not in the spirit of the game overall. So yeah, I've played this game a few times now and I've really enjoyed it every single time. It's uh, definitely a, an eye puller, like people uh, wandering around, like if you're playing in a, a public space, they always come over and they're like, what is going he on here? Because it's just such a picturesque, awesome tower that you are building. Uh, I found this uh, interesting problem with the game where every time I play it, I want to take photos of the wonderful layout that I built, and then I look at the photo on my phone, and it just it just doesn't do it justice, and I think that's because you're not looking at it in 3D to really see the depth of this thing that you are creating. Uh, now, on top of all that, I found that there is um, kind of a cool metagame that has emerged for me when building this. Well, metagame might not be the right word, but if effectively, like, deeper construction strategies. Uh, I found that the first couple times we played, we just made a big tower and it got spindlier and spindlier until, you know, potentially fell over and we lost. But then we started to realize after we played this a few times that this game is really all about strategically building up maybe a couple towers and then putting a big, big piece of cardboard across them to kind of stabilize them and maybe doing that again and then crossing over again. And the amount of um, uh, crossing over with these floors that you can do is definitely going to increase your ability to win the game. And at this point, I, I don't remember exactly how many times I've won or lost, but I can say that I've really enjoyed this game every single time I played it, which is why it is here on the list at uh, location number nine, uh, because I think that it uh, very much deserves to get more attention. I think that there aren't that many cooperative uh, dexterity games that I can think of, and uh, even if there are, I, I do think that this one is probably one of the best. I certainly have really enjoyed playing it. Let's now move on to game number eight, and this one is Neo. Now, this one came out in uh, Essen, I believe, last year, so uh, several months ago. I didn't actually get my copy of this game until January or so, and it's now been played a few times, but it is a 2018 release. And this game has significantly surprised me, honestly. Uh, when uh, the, the publisher first reached out and asked me if I wanted a copy, I looked at some photos online and I said, well... Okay, sure, it looks like you were doing some city building with some square tiles. I've certainly done that before. I've done that with uh, hexagonal tiles with Suburbia a bunch. Uh, I looked into it a little bit and found out that it is a hand drafting style game where you actually uh, have the tiles in your hand and you uh, hold one and then pass the rest to the person on your left. And I was like, okay, those both sound fine. I, I enjoy hand drafting and I like building out cities let's give the game a shot. And I, uh, when I actually got the game, I got to play it pretty quickly. And on that very first play, everyone just really liked it. Like it, it just, it went over very well with everyone at the table. So I played it again and everybody really liked it again. And I played it a third time and it's just done so well every single time I have played it. Um, honestly, it, like I said before, I've been quite surprised. I figured it would be okay, but instead it's now here at number eight on this list. Now let's talk about the reasons why. I mean, obviously I've talked about the base mechanics here. Um, it's not really doing anything innovative when it comes to the uh, hand drafting. Again, you just uh, take one and pass the rest of the person on your left as you're playing, and then everybody simultaneously uses that tile to put it down somewhere into their board area. But um, the things that you are doing, you obviously score a wide variety of things. This is a city building style game, and some of these will seem kind of familiar. Uh, you, you can build out residences, and you can score some pretty big uh, combo multipliers when you have your residences that are adjacent to each other. But another thing that this game does is uh, when it comes to resources, Resources, I, I really like what they do. So you can build out tiles in your area that give you access to infinite amounts of specific resources. And there are a wide variety of these resources. You have um, kind of raw materials, you have process materials, and then you have luxury materials that you gain access to near the very end of the game. And as soon as you make at least one of a thing, you make as much as you need. But then if you want to build a tile that costs resources that you don't have, then you look out to your opponents and you try to find somebody who makes that, and then you can pay them them a, uh, a cost in money to gain access to some of their infinite supply of that resource. Now, the farther they are away from 
you around the table, the slightly uh, increased the overall cost will be, and you can get some discounts uh, for playing your tiles out in specific ways in front of you. But what it means is you, uh, one thing that you can do with this game is try to make a lot of resources, in particular the resources that other people don't do, so that people have to pay you to gain access to that resource. Now, there's no real way to corner the market here, and in fact, uh, you as a player, you don't get any benefit for putting down two tiles of the same resource, besides, I guess, stopping somebody else from putting that tile down so that it forces them to pay you. So I haven't really found um, that to be a thing, but what I have seen is as you're playing this game, certain people will go really hard on resources, and certain people might barely put any resources down, and instead those people might focus on something else like putting a bunch of the blue tiles down, which are, I guess, kind of business district tiles, and they're all about getting you lots of money. They might get you money income that will give you stuff between the rounds, and they might give you lots of one-shot money or conditional money or a variety of uh, ways to get money, and then they can just spend that money giving it to the players who are making the resources. So to a certain extent, everybody's building out these cities in front of themselves, but it doesn't feel like isolated little cities. Like it almost feels like an ecosystem as we are paying each other back and forth to gain access to the resources that everybody has around the table. Now, there are some uh, complexities that uh, exist in this game, and in fact, the, the biggest issue that I have with this game is uh, right there at the very beginning, because um, before you even start playing, you're going to do a draft to get these cornerstone tiles, and these effectively let you dictate your overall strategy for the game. These are somewhat complicated tiles, and they can give you endgame uh, victory point multipliers for doing a variety of different things, and the, the issue here is that these cornerstone tiles are like four times more complicated than the average tile in the rest of the game. So in particular, that very first time we played, it started off pretty rough, like, because nobody had any idea what these tiles did. They all have iconography on them, and the icons are pretty good, but many of these tiles do a lot of different things. And so we were just passing around the rule book like crazy, trying to read the specifics of what each one of our tiles did. Um, honestly, my impression of the game was starting to get pretty low right from the very beginning, because I was like, oh my gosh, this is like a lot of downtime. Is the whole game going to be like this? But then once we had finished out that draft and we actually started playing the game and looked at all of the other tiles, we realized that that process of trying to figure out how all of our cornerstones uh, worked, we now kind of understood how the rest of the icons worked. And we were able to blitz through and uh, understand what all of, uh, essentially all of the other tiles did with very little uh, hiccups trying to go back to the rulebook. So for first time players, it's a bit intimidating having to do a draft before you even start playing with these tiles that do a variety of things. But it is really important to do this draft because as you're playing the game, you want to be working towards this. Um, in the first game that I played, I think two out of the three tiles I grabbed gave me a lot of points for residences, so I went really hard on residences in that game, and I came in second. Uh, I came in with a pretty strong second there. So I think that the ability to play towards a strategy that you have with these cornerstone tiles is really important. It just can be a little bit overwhelming at first. Now, I'm not going to go into the specifics of how all of the rest of the mechanics work, but when it comes to the overall impressions that I've had, um, there are some pretty big selling points for this game. Uh, the first selling point is the simultaneous play nature of the game. It means that we are all doing interesting things um, at the same time. So there is a bit of downtime sometimes if one person is really struggling with the draft, but for the most part, people are making decisions all at the same time, and then you pass the tiles, and you're making decisions all at the same time again, and that means that you can have a uh, somewhat nice, medium weight, Euro-y kind of experience. You know, it's usually about um, an hour 15 to uh, an hour and a half long. Um, but it's a pretty dense experience. Like, you're spending most of that time making interesting decisions. Um, now, the next thing to mention has to do with the actual tile laying itself, and, you know, your your board is a uh, five by five grid, uh, if I'm remembering that correctly, and uh, you obviously have squares, so tile laying is relatively straightforward, and you do have some restrictions because you're not allowed to spin your tiles, and your tiles have these roads, and you have to connect them all up back to your city center as you're playing, so I enjoy the fact that you have some restrictions there, but I also like the fact that they went with square tiles. Like, the, the they didn't have to go with hexagons or something like that. Like, uh, even with the square tiles, there are a lot of great decisions as you're trying to build this stuff out. You uh, actually get penalties if you have residences next to your yellow uh, factories, so you're trying to, you end up having, like, these districts in your area. And also, and you can say this about a lot of uh, town-building games, you kind of form a narrative as you're playing the game based off of the tiles that you make. Like, at a certain point, you might look down and be like, 
oh my gosh, you know, like I, I think one person just kind of had like a prison town. Like they had all these slums, they had prisons, they had police, and it was just like, ugh, like <laughs> they didn't really realize that they were building that town out. Um, and one time that I played, all I did, I just dedicated myself towards making um, resources so that people would pay me. And it's worth noting, you can get a lot of end game points for the resources that you make. And I looked down and I had just barely enough residences to essentially populate all of these different factories. And then like the only food I had was like a corner store and it was just like, oh man, this is just, <laughs> this is just a grisly town just for making resources to send out to everyone else. And then I look over to the person next to me and they have like this idyllic um, uh, town just full of like shopping malls and supermarkets and, you know, a wonderful massive skyscrapers all over the place with very little resources. And they've just been paying me to make that happen. And it's just a cool ecosystem. So I think at this point, I've maybe talked about this one a little bit longer than I should have, but I was, uh, I've been very impressed with Neom and everyone that I have introduced, introduced this to has enjoyed it. Uh, um, I think more than, I think everyone has been pleasantly surprised. Like they look at it and like, this looks fine. And then everyone has walked away from it saying, actually that game was great. And I'm looking forward to playing it again. At this point, we've reached game number seven, and this one is Railroad Inc. Now, technically, you could say this is actually games number seven, because when Railroad Inc. came out last year, it came out with a deep blue version and a blazing red version. And the base rules for each one of these boxes are identical, but in each box, there are two different expansions. Um, with the red version, you have meteors and lava, and with the blue version, you have lakes and you have rivers. Now, every time you play Railroad Inc., you can select one of these expansions to play with, or you could just play the base version version of the game, and I have, at this point, played all four of the expansions and the base game many times. In fact, my overall play count is eight for Railroad Inc. at this point, and um, that alone is one of the reasons why it is over here on the list at game number seven, but also, at this point, I feel like this is the best roll-and-write game that I have played. Now, I, I say that with quotes because this is kind of a new genre of game that is gaining a lot of popularity, and the base idea here and with many of this type of game is that uh, some dice are rolled in the middle of the table, and then everybody will simultaneously use the results of those dice, and they will write those down onto their um, pad in front of themselves, in front of their area. Now, when it comes to Railroad Inc., you actually have these dry erase boards with these dry erase pens, and what you are doing is you are drawing rail lines and road lines on your uh, uh, area in front of yourself, and you are going to score um, a, a multiplier based off of how many connected exits you have with the, uh, the different rail lines going into roads, and you get some bonus points for how long your roads are and how long your rail lines are. There's some um, uh, lots of little uh, ways to score points in this game, but the main idea is trying to make big networks of these uh, different types of lines in your player board. And I think the reason why this game is my favorite roll and write game at the moment is because every single turn feels like a big puzzle. Now, there are lots of roll and write games out there where you might flip a card or roll some dice, uh, and um, it might be a number or two, and you kind of write those down onto your pad. But in Railroad Inc., you always roll four dice in the base game, and if you're playing with an expansion, you roll six dice, actually. And when it comes to those, even those four dice, they will have a variety of different um, roads and rail lines that you have to put down, and you have to put all four of those down into your area. So so every single turn is like this tasty puzzle of like, how am I going to interconnect all four of these things in to, to the greater uh, network that I am building? And how am I going to build myself out so that I have lots of availability to um, expand out and get lots of points in the uh, future turns as well? So I just, I like the fact that you have so much to think about every single turn. It seems like every turn is pretty meaty. And then you do seven turns and the game is over and you score everything up. Now, um, that alone honestly, I think would get this game onto my top 10 list. But then the fact that you have these expansions available really adds a bunch of wonderful flavor to the game as well. Now, each version of this game, I think, costs around 20-ish dollars, and each version has enough materials to play with six people. So if you want to have all, uh, all four expansions, you have to pay essentially $40. But at that point, you also have enough materials to play this game with up to 12 people, which would actually, I think, play fine, because this is a multiplayer solitaire game. Nothing that you do impacts your opponents. You're just trying to do the best that you can with the die rolls and try to do it better than all of your opponents try to out-puzzle them when it comes to these die rolls. So from my perspective, I think that having 
having both of these in a collection makes tons of sense because um, each one of these expansions adds its own little variety. Um, the river expansion is really simple. It just adds a river that you can put down to get some extra points. I like that extra flex extra flexibility there. And the lake expansion is just like a brain exploder because you ha can have fairies to connect all of these different things. So it's like the uh, deep blue version has the easiest and most complicated of the iterations of Railroad Inc. that are out right now. And then when it comes to the red version, you have the uh, volcano one where you actually have to deal with these uh, pools of lava that might expand out and actually destroy some of your roads, but you can actually get a decent amount of points for those pools of lava and you can make new volcanoes, which it might be in your best interest, but if you're making volcanoes, that does uh, not mean good things for your overall network. And then the other of uh, the red expansions is the meteor, which is maybe one of the more um, interesting from a mechanical perspective because you roll those two dice and it causes a meteor to crash on a specific spot on your board and it destroys anything that was there already, but you get a decent amount of bonus points for every connection that are pointed into a meteor because there's all these valuable materials that you can harvest from those meteors. So it's not that big of a deal to have a meteor crash into a spot that you've already uh, drawn on because now you just try to focus all of your attention to trying to connect up those meteors. And I think that all four of these expansions add a wonderful amount of variety to the game. I think that um, every time I play this game, all eight times, I have really enjoyed every single turn. Even if I'm like, you know, pulling my hair out, like, oh my gosh, how can we never roll a straight railroad line? Like, that's all I need and it's been like four turns. But at the same time, I enjoy that kind of uh, uh, mental uh, strife when it comes to uh, doing these things because everybody's dealing with it. And it's the kind of thing where if you find yourself backed into a corner, well, you did that to yourself and you have only yourself to blame. And also this game usually lasts about half an hour, like it doesn't take a very long time. So you can play with um, six or even 12 people if you buy both copies in about half an hour. Everyone who's playing it is having an engaged, thinky, wonderful time in a small amount of time. So overall, I think this one is just a big winner. Like it's gonna see a lot more play, um, I think. Um, I, I really enjoy um, the, the act of playing with it in addition to the fact that it is so flexible to actually get played with other people. So I'm happy to have it in my collection and I think it really deserves a spot on the list. All right, we've now reached game number six, and this one is Passing Through Petra. Now, this one came out in the second half of 2018, and I've played it several times at this point, and it is a strange and intriguing puzzly style game. Now, uh, my initial impression of this game, just looking at photos that I saw online, I didn't really expect all that much from it. Uh, the board is a little bland, if I'm being honest. You know, it's it's got a lot of kind of yellow. It's set in the desert, and then you have this uh, row of tiles in the middle with these plastic walls, kind of candy in walls that the tiles are going to be shepherded through. And um, those look pretty cool, but I think overall I was maybe maybe just not really all that enthralled by the overall artistic aesthetic of the game. But I, I heard enough about it to want to try it at Board Game Geekcon last year, and I played a four-player game of this, and it blew all four of us away. Uh, we all liked it so much. In fact, uh, Jessica, my wife, um, it's one of her favorite games right now. Uh, we decided to go out and purchase a copy of this game, and we have played it many times since then. So uh, let me talk a little bit more about how this game plays, then I'll talk about why it's on this list. Now, every single turn, you are going to make a decision. You're going to go uh, take an action by moving a pawn that is in this 3x3 three three matrix. Now, the direction that you move the pawn is going to dictate the action that you get to take, but once you are against a wall where an action is, you can't take that action anymore. So, right from the beginning, this is a wonderful action selection mechanism because it means if you want to, uh, say, uh, take some tiles from the uh, general market area, you could do that a couple times, but then you run against a wall and you can't do that action anymore until you do the opposite action to kind of walk your pawn away from it, which involves cashing these tiles in. Uh, now, this obviously works in the four different dimensions, so you have to puzzle this out and make sure that you are setting yourself up to do a variety of things. You can't just keep doing a thing over and over again because you'll find yourself in a corner and then you must do a different action, which maybe you haven't set yourself up well, uh, well for, and then it doesn't actually go that well for you. Now, what you actually do with these actions in general is you are going to pick up these tiles from the middle of the board, either from the end of of the row or from the middle of the row and you're gonna put them down into your own player board area. Uh, I guess the idea here is these are merchants ent entering Petra, and then you can kind of, uh, you know, uh, squirrel them away over to your area, and then you have your own little line there as well. So this game is all about lines of different colored tiles. So you shove that person into the line down in front of you uh, when you add them in, and then and if any people fall out the other end, which I think they always will, uh, then you take that person and you move them to the top of your board, which is essentially the encampment area. So that's now not a merchant, that's a person who can actually trade with different 
different people. And this probably isn't making a lot of sense, but effectively what happens is you're setting yourself up to make a big combo turn when you do a specific action where you will look to your board and it will say something along the lines of uh, count up the number of teal merchants that are in the line down below and multiply that by the number of maybe purple merchants that are up above in that encampment. You multiply those things together, you get your value, maybe it's, you know, something like nine, and then you look out to the main board where there are these wheels and you move your disc around that wheel that number of steps. I believe there are seven steps as you go around here and this is kind of the main um, engine of the game because as you are going around, you're going to gain these extra abilities that might uh, give you wild merchants that can trade with anybody. Uh, you might be able to expand out your merchant row. Uh, you might get other uh, benefits like permanent encampments and whatnot. But then also you get to drop off cubes after you hit certain spots on these wheels. And this is a game with no victory points. Um, right from the get-go, if you just looked at it, if you walked by, saw some people playing it, you would probably assume that you would count up your victory points for a variety of different things at the end and whoever had the most points wins. But this is actually a race. Each player has a number of these cubes in front of themselves and it's just a race to be the first person to get rid of all of your cubes and then that person wins. Um, you know, if there's a, a tie, I think then uh, there's maybe a slight tiebreaker or something like that. But this game is really about getting rid of your cubes in a couple of different ways. And spinning around those wheels is one of the main ways that you are going to do it. Um, now, I don't, again, want to go into too many of the specifics here, but this should set um, uh, an expectation up in your mind of, of the broad uh, scope of how you play this game. Because what it means is you are trying to pull the tiles in to put into your row that are going to match up well with the encampments that you have above. But every person that you put down into your row is going to end up going up into an encampment as you get more people and it scoots those people out of your row. So you're constantly thinking about, well, what's my next um, big uh, scoring multiplier going to be? But what's the one going to be after that? Because, okay, maybe I'm trying to get a bunch of teal people down here to score off with those purple people. And then I do that and I get a bunch of things and I drop a couple cubes off. But now time goes on and now those teal people are falling out and they're kind of stacking up here. Well, what is the teal actually multiply against? Oh, that, that one goes against the, um, the orange maybe. And so now you are trying to get orange as well and every time you actually cash out these uh, big combo turns, it kind of locks you out from that and it liquidates all of the encampment there. So you're not set up to do that one over and over again. So this game is essentially... It kind of feels like a big slow wheel is turning uh, of um, strategic logic where you're trying to get specific colors now, but then at the right moment, you're like, and now I need to get the next set of colors to work well with the previous wave. And now I need to get the next set of colors to work with the previous wave. But as you're playing the game, you're not always going to have the ability to do that because everybody is going after all of these different tiles. Now, each player board is different. So you, uh, one person might have teal multiply against purple. Another person might have teal multiply against the red. So that kind of varies things up. But overall, the way this mechanism works is just wonderfully satisfying. Uh, the first time we played this game, but we were halfway through it and everyone was just like, this game is so weird. This game is so cool. <laughs> and uh, that uh, that feeling has persisted as I have played this game many more times. Now, another big selling point for this game is the fact that it is not very long. Uh, the probably average play time for a four-player game of this is like 50 minutes to maybe an hour. So you are just getting these wonderful uh, thinking moments as you're trying to set things up, set things up, and then have these explosive big combo turns, which are very satisfying as you build out all of your different benefits and as you get all these cubes out and you also have this kind of breathless race kind of thing in the back of your head as you're looking down and you're like okay I'm ahead I'm like maybe even two cubes ahead you're planning this big thing up a couple turns go by and you look over and you're like holy cow that person got like three down in that one turn with this massive move now I'm suddenly behind and I don't know. It just overall, every single time I've played this game, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I have to admit that from a variable uh, variability perspective, you don't really bring new things in versus um, from one game to the next. Uh, there are these cards that you can acquire when you do a specific action that can uh, let you combo different things. And each time you play, you're going to probably see a different set of those cards, which vary things up a little bit. Um, but um, I don't think variability is really the selling point for this game. The selling point is that it is so different and that even after playing this game, I think four or five times at this point, I am still looking forward to playing it more because just every time I think back to every moment when I'm sitting there in the middle of the game thinking about stuff, I've just in, been enjoying myself. I just really have liked how all of these decisions come into play. I like how fresh the overall feeling is for it. And that is why it is at number six on the list.
It's now time to move on to the next game, and this one is Scorpius Freighter at number 5. Now, I got to play this one for the first time at Board Game Geek Con last year, and despite a somewhat rough first game because I had trouble uh, with the rules because I'd read them a couple days earlier, I went away from that play feeling like I really wanted to try it again, and AEG is the publisher, and they, they actually sent me a copy of it. And at this point, I've now played it, I think, five times because it really latched on, and I really started to love this game. Now, from a mechanical perspective, there are some really neat things going on here. The first thing that you'll probably notice if you look at uh, a table with people playing it is there are three circles in the middle of the main board, and these are um, communal rondelles. Um, now, if you're not familiar with the term rondelle, it's a, me a mechanism in games where effectively you uh, move around it, and the uh, the spaces in front of yourself on the rondelle usually dictate the actions that you can take, and usually you can only go a certain number of spaces forward. Now, in this game, um, you actually have these three rondelles with a communal marker on it, and when it is your turn, you have to use some of your crew in order to move that rondelle one or two spaces forward, and then wherever it lands, you can activate the ability that is associated there based off of the strength power of your unactivated uh, crew that is on your ship. Now, when it comes to your crew, uh, the game has these seven pre-made uh, sets of four crew that you can play, and they're kind of um, obviously oriented towards different strategies as you're playing, and it does an interesting thing where you just start the game with all of your crew, and uh, you don't have to actually, like, you, don't, you never get new crew, and where the crew is on your ship doesn't specifically matter, but every single crew member has a special ability that you can gain access to if you upgrade them through one of the actions in the main area, and you can kind of see those as you're playing, trying to build up some combos. But but the real kicker for this game, the real reason why I have kind of fallen in love with it, has to do with that flow of the three rondelles in the middle. Now you have the first rondelle, which is all about uh, gaining these tiles to put onto your ship that you have in front of yourself. Now this is kind of a uh, personal tile laying puzzle because the pieces that you put down there are either going to be storage um, tiles that you can um, store different types of uh, resources on because you're effectively smugglers trying to uh, do uh, illicit deeds without the galactic empire seeing what you're doing. Uh, so you're putting these storage units down into your area, but then you're also putting these pieces of equipment down into your area, and where you put them down really matters. If you put uh, like colored storage next to like colored storage, then you will likely be able to um, get more of that material when you end up getting some stuff, and the pieces of equipment can do a variety of things. So the first rondelle is just about putting tiles down onto your board. The second rondelle is all about using those tiles on your board to get stuff. Uh, on that one, you might be able to gain resources with uh, most, if not all, of your uh, storage containers, just getting the various uh, different color resources to put down into those areas based off of how adjacent they are to different things. But then you can also activate your equipment, which can do a wide variety of really cool things that sometimes has to do with the adjacency of where that equipment is on your player area to activating different things, um, to even doing some special bonusy actions. So you can have some really good combo stuff going on there. Now, there is a third rondelle on the board, and that one is all about using the resources that you have made uh, in order to get points. Uh, you can either do that through side deals, which are effectively very small set collection goals, right? Just getting rid of a couple resources here or there for points. Or you can use that rondelle to complete contracts, which are more complicated set collection um, tasks as you're trying to get different combos of the different types of resources. And then when you complete them, you get a lot of points, but then you also will get extra one-shot abilities to kind of launch you into trying to do more stuff. So you are going to be playing this game, moving these different communal rondelles around, and obviously as you do actions, that's going to change the different action set uh, of options for the next player, but you always have all three of these rondelles worth of stuff to pay attention to as you're playing. And this game just has this wonderful ebb and flow of like, in the early game, you're just constantly just building out your ship a bunch, and then you're using your ship a bunch, and then you're starting to cash things out, and then near the end of the game, everybody's kind of stopped building out their ship, their ship is fine, and they're just constantly using the middle rondelle to get more stuff, and then the last one to try and uh, use all of their stuff. And I think as an engine, it works really, really well. But then on top of that, this game has a significant amount of variability that adds to the replayability of this game, because not only are there seven of these pre-constructed decks of uh, crews that you can play, but there is a variant in the back where instead of using one of these, you just do a full-on draft. You shuffle all of these different crew together, and then you draft six of them, and then you choose four of those six, and that will be your crew for the entire game. And I have played with this variant, and it is really neat, because some of these crew um, will get you points at the end of the game, some of them will give you uh, various conditional benefits as you're playing the game, and when you play with the pre-constructed decks, they're fine. They're, they're very, like, you might get one and be like, okay, so I'm the people who make lots of money, and I'm going to use money to do stuff. Cool. That's very straightforward. Or you might be like, oh, I'm the people who make lots of storage and I'll 
I guess I'll make a lot of stories this game. But when you draft these things around, uh, we uh, when we played this way, one player drafted like three of the end game victory point cards to try and really boost up the score at the end. Um, I can't even remember specifically what I did, but I pieced together some pretty cool combos with the crew uh, based off of that draft. And then on top of that, there are also these variable uh, cockpits that you can play with um, that you uh, put down onto your board and they will make every single person right from the very beginning uh, different with the pieces of equipment they that they have. And in fact, at this moment, I do want to say that if you uh, play Scorpius Vader, it is my personal opinion that you should always play with the variable uh, asymmetric cockpits instead of using the cockpit that is pre-printed on the board. Um, I played with the pre-printed one many times and I feel like it skews the game a little bit uh, too much towards equipment and people kind of ignored doing storage facilities. But when I played with the uh, different cockpits, that wasn't the case and everything balanced out really wonderfully. And honestly, the game um, just leveled up when I start when I decided to uh, play this game with that variant and also with the drafting variant, although you should probably play a couple games before you actually do the draft variant. So overall, I, I've just been really impressed with the flow of this game, of all of the decisions that you have as you are trying to build out effectively a spatial engine in front of yourself and then run that engine to try and get the resources you need to squeeze as many points as you can before the game ends. The game ends as soon as uh, any one of those three communal rondelles spins around a certain number of times. And so, um, you know, if people really go crazy on one rondelle, that might actually cause the game to end somewhat early. But in all of my plays, this it's usually been never more than 90 minutes with uh, within a given play. So I've just been super impressed with uh, Scorpius Fetter. I think mechanically it's solid. I think variability-wise, uh, there is a lot to play. Like every time you sit down to play this game, you are going to build out a different type of engine. Uh, one game you might go crazy on side deals and another game you might go crazy on contracts. There's just so many different things that you could do here and I've just been really impressed with it. At this point, we are starting to get to the lower numbers. Uh, we are now at number four, and this game is Lowlands. Now, this game came out in, I think, June-ish or so of 2018. And uh, right from the get-go, when you take a look at Lowlands, it looks like a very generic Euro-style game. You uh, Each player has their own player board. Um, they start the game with some sheep and some little fence posts on your area. Uh, you have lots of green uh, with the art overall, and you have a hand of cards with you know stone and clay and wood. These all seem like very tropey standard things. But when I started learning about this game, and in particular when I started playing it, I realized that this is a very interesting game. Like, it, it is not your average Euro game in the slightest. Now, the central mechanic of this game, uh, or the, cent the central conceit of this game, is that there is uh, water coming in. Uh, you are, I guess, in the uh, uh, Scandinavia area. I don't remember exactly uh, which specific country, but um, there is water. The ocean is coming in, and you have to build dikes collectively as a community. Everyone around the table is communally spending actions to build dikes, and you spend resource cards that you have in your hand to build out these dikes. Now, Every time you um, you help out with the construction of the dikes, you will move yourself up on that uh, dike track. And this is effectively like everybody being like, hey, look, that blue player over there, they're really trying to help the community out by really focusing on getting that dike built out. But the thing is that um, by spending actions to work on that, um, you are not doing other things like breeding tons of sheep. And uh, sheep are a big way that you can get a lot of points in this game. But at certain points as you are playing the game, you will effectively have a high tide. And at that moment, you check to see if there is more water than there are dike pieces to actually hold it back. Now, as you're playing throughout the round, the water, you will learn more and more about how, more, how much water there will be when you have that high tide moment. And when that happens, if the dike is big enough, then that's awesome. Like, congratulations, everybody you can high five because they held the water back. Everything is fine. And then what happens is the uh, person who contributed the most towards the uh, dikes, essentially the person who is farthest along the track, is going to get the most amount of points and the second um, best person will get the second most points because they will get points based off of their position compared to the person who contributed the least. So if one person did just nothing with the dike track and somebody went crazy with it and then they actually held the water back, then that person who went crazy with it is going to get a lot of points. But here is an interesting thing, and that is that there is this sliding multiplier for endgame scoring where the more times you hold the dike back, the less points you actually get at the end of the game for having contributed to the dike. I guess people just kind of collectively ignore the threat of the sea. They're like, they're like, hey, look at me. I did all this stuff with the dike. And people are like, yeah, whatever. Like, nope, no sheep died at the end of this game. Like, you know, quick tooting your own horn. And in that case, if the dike gets held back, um, uh, if the dike is big enough through every single round of the game, then the sheep will be worth, be worth just tons of points uh, because it's kind of an inverse multiplier. The less points the dike track is worth, the more points sheep are worth. And the inverse is the, the, um, the more often that the dike 
dike is not built up big enough, and the water spills over the dike and starts killing people's sheep, well, the more victory points you get at the end of the game for being a person who contributed to the dike. Because at the end of the game, you can be like, look at all this work I did. Look how, you know, uh, awful things got. Like, all these sheep died, but I did my best. And so that person will get a lot of points in that uh, respect. So what this means is you have this wonderful uh, seesaw in the game where you are trying to um, do you're trying to breed sheep and you're trying to uh, repair the dike as you're playing, but you don't want to overcommit to one of these and allow other players to just go crazy. Like if you start the game and you're just like, all I'm going to do this game is build out the dike. That's going to be my plan. And that's what we're going to do. Then everybody else is going to be like, cool. Thanks for building out the dike, build and, and spend all of their actions instead of building the dike, just breeding tons of sheep that are worth tons of points. So then you have this interesting thing where if you start the game, maybe you're like in the early stages, you're like, I'm going to build a lot of the dike. I'm going to push, push, push. And then you're like, oh, people are going crazy on sheep. Well, then maybe what you should do is actually stop building the dike so that the water goes a little bit over and it starts overflowing and washing these sheep away. And suddenly those sheep are actually worth less because the slider moves over and now your dike points are worth more. So you... You as a person who invests a lot of actions in getting dike points actually want the dike to break. So you have this wonderful social dynamic of people talking back and forth about who is going to get it to whichever point and is it worth it to them to do this or that and the other thing. So that's just a wonderful push and pull mechanism. Now, there are some other really good things going on in Lowlands. In particular, the action selection mechanism is quite simple, but uh, very effective. Every person has three workers and one of them does two actions, one does three actions, and one does four actions. Now, um, as you're playing the game, when it's your turn, you do use one of your workers and you activate one of the four main actions you can do in the game. But it's not really work replacement because you activate it on your own personal board. You never interact with your opponents in this way, but that means every single round you need to decide what action you're going to do for two, what's going to be three, and what's going to be four, and you are going to change your priority as the game goes on. Um, you might be like, okay, I'm going to send my four over here to the dike building action because I have a lot of cards for it, and oh my gosh, the dike is about to break, and I have all these sheep, and I want to do what I can to actually save these sheep, even though, you know, if we save the dike, then it means the sheep are worth slightly less, but you still actually want to have them. Um, I have not seen anyone win this game and not actually have sheep. I've seen people win with a lot less sheep than other players, but um, either way, it, it's definitely something to consider. So uh, the action selection mechanism is simple. It just works. And then you have this wonderful push-pull of the environment of this dike being built and the storm coming in and the water coming in and everybody's kind of stressing about, out about how it's all going to play out. It just makes a wonderful social dynamic. And I don't want to make this sound like a social game. You're not really negotiating, but it also makes a wonderful mechanical environment as you're trying to figure out what the result, what the uh, the results of your uh, your decisions actually are, like what are the consequences of my decision to do this versus that? And on top of all that, I didn't even mention that when you're building out the dike, you actually um, have to ask an opponent if they want to help you out with that dike building process. And if they do help, then you get an extra little bump. But they also get to help with their uh, their marker up on the track. So you have that element of trying to figure out who you actually want to ask if you want them to help you out or not, as you're trying to figure out where everybody is in the game. I haven't even talked talked about the fact that there are a bunch of different buildings that you're going to build out into your area as you expand your pasture out and the more fence posts you put down, the more resources you get when you take income, but I don't need to go into all those details. Uh, long story short, there is a decent amount of variety here because you do see different sets of those buildings each play and you can't build many of them and they are going to uh, give you combos that will make you better at one thing in one game and better at another thing in another game. But every time I play this game, I think the push and pull and tension of the dike and the water level has just felt really fun. Like I've just enjoyed the uh, the stress that that puts on the overall table. And it also just feels new. Like this is not at all the plain generic Euro game that it looks when you first walk by it. It actually has some really fresh, cool ideas in it. At this point, we've reached game number three, and this one is Underwater Cities. Now, this is the newest game from the designer uh, Vladimir Suchi, and in fact, this is the first published game from Delicious Games, which is a publishing house that I believe is actually run by uh, Vladimir Suchi and his uh, wife Katka. Now, I reached out to them before Essen Spiel about getting a uh, press copy, and I was able to actually secure that uh, with a discount because they're a new company. They couldn't really give away a ton of uh, different copies of this. Uh, so I was able to pick it up at Essen last year, and I was quite interested in trying it, although I wasn't necessarily expecting it to become one of my favorite games of the year. Now, uh, mechanically, what's going on in this game from the outset is it seems like it's just a worker placement game. Uh, every single time you have a turn, you have uh, three workers, and you take a worker, and you put it out onto a spot on the central player board. Um, you can't go somewhere uh, somebody else has already been, and then you evaluate the spot that's there, and then you can move on. 
Now, in general, I think worker placement is fine, but um, I am much more interested in interesting action selection mechanisms. And the reason that really uh, this game really caught my eye is because in addition to that worker placement, there is a card playing aspect to the game that goes along with it. So every single turn, you're gonna draw a card up into your hand and you have a, a hand limit of, I think, three and it can go higher as you're playing the game, uh, getting different uh, combo things. But every single time you play out a worker, you must play a card from your hand. Now, the thing is, if that card does not match the color of the region you play to, then you literally just discard the card. You don't get to do anything with it. However, if the region you put your worker on matches the color of the card in your hand, then not only do you do the action of where you put your worker, but you do all of the actions that are listed on the card that you just played along with it. Now, some of these cards are just one-shot actions. You just immediately get resources, or um, many of them have conditional things, like if you have an upgraded desalination plant, then you get to do this kind of thing. So that card might be really good for one player because they have an upgraded desalination plant, and for another player, that might uh, they might just discard it, like they not even worry about it because it's not really going to work towards what they're doing. Now, many of these cards can actually be played out in front of you into a growing tableau, and um, some of them can, are action cards, and when you do specific actions on the the main area in the board, it will allow you to do extra actions that are the cards you have in front of yourself. So they're kind of like combo bonusy actions. But there are also lots of cards that are conditional benefits. Uh, you put them in front of yourself, they got a little infinity symbol on them essentially, and every time a certain thing happens, then this card activates and you get a certain reward. Now a big pleasure of this game is trying to put together combos of these cards um, th with these um, these effects, trying to have uh, synergies with them. Uh, maybe get a card that um, uh, gives you benefits when you go to specific spots on the political track and then get another card that gives you bonuses when you um, that make it easier to actually go up that political track or you know that kind of combo or perhaps um, get lots of cards that give you bonuses for building tunnels and then try to get an action card out that lets you build tunnels more efficiently and that kind of thing. Now obviously I've just been talking about the action selection mechanism at this point but the game is called Underwater Cities and what you're doing is each player has a, um, a player mat in front of themselves and they are building out tunnels on this player mat and these underwater cities that are dome cities. And in each one of these cities, you are also going to be building out uh, laboratories, desalination plants, as well as kelp farms. And at three points throughout the game, you are going to run your engine. And that means everything that is on your player mat in front of yourself is going to um, give you what it makes. Uh, some things just make points, some things make food, some things make um, uh, science and metal, uh, tokens, that kind of stuff. And this game is really all about building out that engine while you are doing worker placement actions and trying to do those actions to sync up with the random cards that you have in your hand. Now, um, you get these cards, uh, there are a couple ways to draw extra cards, but in general, you just draw a card at the end of your turn. So you're constantly looking at a hand of cards, some of which you want to save until later, but you have a hand limit of three, so it's really hard to do that if you have a bunch of cards you want to use in the future, but you don't want to use them right now. And you also are conflicted with the action place. There might be an action spot you really want to go to, but it doesn't match any of the colors of the cards in your hand. So is it worth it to go there, do the action you really need to do, and discard a card without getting that benefit? Or do you do a different action that's slightly less good for you, but now you get to do the action of the card and the action spot there, and is that worth it to you. Uh, so all of these things work together really well, and I have really enjoyed the process of building out this underwater city in front of me. Uh, when you actually get to the point where you run your engine, it's wonderful just getting all of these different resources, and you're like, I'm never going to spend all these. And then three turns later, you're like, I am out of resources. And then you do another uh, production phase, and you have even more this time because you have built out your engine even bigger, and that is just a very fun aspect to the game. Now, at this point, um, I do want to mention that this game game was at one point my best, my favorite game of 2018. Uh, I think that after playing this game a couple times, I told many people that. I said, I think, you know, Underwater Cities, this is the best game that came out last year. I've just absolutely fallen in love with it. But obviously, I'm now talking about it here at game number three. Now, part of that is because the games number two and one are also really excellent games, but a big reason that Underwater Cities fell down a couple steps for me has to do with player count. Now, this game plays two, three, and four players, and there are two maps. On one side of the board, you have just two players. You flip it over, and then that side of the board is for three and for four players. Now, this game is brilliant at two players, and this game is brilliant at three players. The problem is that if you play a four-player game, you play on that same three-player map, and the only thing that changes is you add a single 
tile onto the board that lets you clone an action spot that somebody else, uh, else went onto already. And that's the only balance for the player count. Now, when you're playing this game, you are going to be taking uh, 10, uh, you're going to go through uh, 10 overall rounds, and each round you're going to take three actions. So that means every single player is going to take 30 actions, which is on the high side for worker placement games in general. And when you add a fourth player in, they're just going to take 30 actions. So that's just a big chunk of extra time that's going to get added onto the game. But on top of that, you have the fact that the board, you only added one extra spot uh, with, when you're adding an entire another person with their three worker placement actions. So what that means is there's a lot more conflict for the worker placement spaces. So you might be building this plan up and then somebody goes down, they go into the spot that you needed. That means you have to do something else. And that's kind of the main crux of worker placement and that's fine. But in a four player game, your plans are going to get disrupted way more often because it's just a lot more uh, contention for those different spaces. And on top of the fact that you have an extra player in those extra 30 actions, um, the experience that I have seen is that um, three player games usually take about two hours, maybe like uh, two and a half on the, the long side. Uh, a two player game that I played, we finished in like an hour and 45 minutes, but I have not personally played any four player games, but I've heard and I've known people who have that have played like four and a half to five hour games uh, for players. And that's just too long, I think, for this game when you consider the amount of downtime that must have been happening between your turns with these people. In fact, I've played this game, I mean, I've talked to people who played this game the first time at four players, um, uh, and they just, they're like, oh, Underwater Cities, that game was horrible. It took us five hours. And I'm like, well, I can't really say that they're wrong. I think that this is one of the best games that came out last year, arguably the best the game that came at the, the game that came out last year. But the fact that the four player count just seems so detrimental to the funness of this game means I did have to slide it back a little bit. Um, at this point, unless a really good variant comes out, uh, maybe even designer approved variant uh, for playing this game at four, um, I don't think I'm ever going to play it at four. Like I've, I've had situations where three people really wanted to play it at, um, along with me. And I just said, I can either teach this to you and I'll do something else or let's just play another four-player game that plays really good at four players because Underwater Cities doesn't, um, at least from uh, my perspective and the people that I play with. So I am actively looking forward to playing this game a lot more in the future at three players. I think two players is also amazing. It has its own side of the board. So it's obviously very well-tuned for the two-player overall experience. And um, just the process of uh, figuring out all these tactical decisions every single turn of what worker placement to go and what card to choose along with that, uh, in addition to the overall st strategy of the game as you're building out this engine, on top of the fact that there are these um, end game uh, modifier cards that give you conditional points for doing very, various different things that you're also trying to keep in mind in addition to the fact that you are working out on your player board that can get, connect you up to different metropolises. There's just so many wonderful things to think about that um, this game is just, it's just amazing. I, I, I love it and if there was a, a good way to play this game at four, then I think it would have easily been the number one game of the year for me. But as it stands, it's number three, which is still really high up there and I'm looking forward to lots more plays at the two and three player count. At this point, we are getting pretty darn close to the end. We now have game number two, and this one is Key Flow. Now, this one came out at Essen last year, and it is effectively a new modified version of Key Flower, uh, and Key Flower came out many years ago. Now, Key Flower is a beloved Euro game that has a really funky and interesting and very stressful uh, auction mechanic. Uh, it also has tile laying and worker placement and all that kind of stuff going on uh, as you are acquiring different resources in different seasons uh, and trying to turn those resources into things that are going to give you points. Now in Key Flow, you have um, pretty much all of that same uh, Key Flower stuff, except instead of having the uh, auction and instead of having the worker placement and the hidden workers and all that, you now have hand drafting kind of like Seven Wonders. So in this case, you um, uh, deal out all the cards for a given season. You uh, choose one and then you pass it to the left or the right, depending on the season. And then everybody simultaneously uses that card to build out their uh, tableau area. Now uh, it's very blatant that Key Flow is supposed to be a kind of streamlined and drafting version of Key Flower. It's even in the name. Uh, I guess, you know, things flow. There's a river that you're kind of building out in front of yourself, but it's also, you know, Key Flow is just Key Flower without an ER at the end of it. Now, as you're actually uh, playing this game, let's talk about the mechanics of it a little bit more. What you're doing is building out a uh, town in front of yourself, and you are going to move uh, to the right and to the left, or left and right, with a camera, uh, and uh, you're going to be building these buildings out as well as a waterfront. And what you're trying to do in addition to build out your town in front of yourself is you're going to play these cards that have workers on them, either on your own area to activate your buildings or onto the areas of the opponents to your uh, right or your left. Now, if you do that, then you are essentially donating that card with the worker on it to them. And 
at the end of this game, once you go through four full seasons, you get points for so many different things. <laughs> As you are playing through these seasons, there's kind of different vibes. Like the first season is just about kind of building out your town and maybe getting um, um, a couple of different animals, and that kind of stuff for end game points. The second season, things ramp up as you get access to boats, which give you conditional, uh, which give you ongoing uh, rule breaking, tweaking type things. And then when you finally make it over to winter, which is the final season, there are just tons of cards that you can draft and put into your uh, town that will give you points for doing stuff like extra points for gold. Gold is normally worth, worth one point, but maybe you'll have a jeweler and now it's worth two points. Um, you might put a thing down there that will give you points for a combo of things, like for every pig and a tool that you dedicate towards that when you do end game scoring, you get four points. There are also lots of cards that will give you um, points for the different uh, workers that you have um, accumulated throughout the game. And you accumulate the workers that activate in your town. Again, you can uh, send your workers to your opponents, but that means you might be giving them cards that will conditionally score off of the winter cards that they end up having over there. So what this means is as you're playing this game, you uh, are drafting these cards and you're really trying to figure out what the right card is for you in this moment, but you also need to look out to your opponents and see, am I passing them really good stuff? Maybe if this is too good for them, maybe it's okay for me so I can play that and stop them from taking that. But you also need to pay attention to your opponents to your right and your left because you can activate their buildings and maybe they've um, been upgrading their buildings. They can do a whole bunch of cool stuff with them and it's worth it to you to send a worker over there to activate that and get the benefits of that really cool building that they've been building out. And you're okay with getting rid of that worker because maybe maybe based off of the conditions that you have, you're not even going to get points for that anyway. So, you know, you don't have to really worry about it. So the tension of this game is really just every single round, every single turn, trying to figure out what is the right card to play in that right moment. Um, are you going to be able to make up, um, are you going to be able to get the cards that will give you the points based off of the conditions that you have in front of you? Um, at the very beginning of the game, everybody has some of those winter cards that they, and one of them, they get to auto draft at the very beginning of winter. So you already have an idea of what is going to be out there and you can um, have dibs essentially on one of those endgame scoring conditions. So right from the very beginning of the game, you can be working towards that. So all of these things are really wonderful, and I think I'm maybe talking about the mechanics of it a little bit too much, because, um, well, when it comes to the reason why this game is on this list and why it is so high up this list, um, that has to do with the, um, the wonderful decisions that you're making, but it also has to do with how incredibly uh, versatile this game is when it comes to playgroups. Now, I've played this game four times at this point, and it uh, plays up to six players. And I think three of those four games have been at six players. Um, now, it's very rare to find a Euro-style game of resource acquisition, of engine building, of playing off of your opponents that also plays well at five and six players. And Key Flow is so good at these player counts. In fact, I would argue that it is best at six players because it makes the setup at the start of the game much simpler. Um, if you play with five, four, three, or two, if you play with less players than six, you have to pull certain cards out and certain other cards. So the setup can be a little bit annoying. It's not too bad. You just really have to pay attention to the setup instructions in the rule book. But um, playing this game six players, man, you just deal out all these cards and you just jump right into it. And the cards just make sense. And every single time I play this game, it's never gone over an hour. And I felt like it's just been such a wonderfully dense hour of great decisions of, of um, you know, if I do this, then that. And like, do I give this to my opponents? And just all these wonderful thoughts. And I guess when I consider it uh, compared to Key Flower, that game, uh, I've only played it once. I played a three-player game of that, and it took over two hours. And we were all new to the game, and I understand that's probably why there was so much analysis paralysis and downtime in that play. But that game also has auctions where you are bidding with hidden workers behind your screens, so you are contemplating what does my worker have? What have I seen my worker have and my, my opponents have? Uh, what have I seen them take in the past and how is that going to apply to my strategy? Whereas here in Key Flow, do you just have the cards in front of yourself and you're trying to figure out which ones to use? Some of them might come back around to you based off of the player count. And I think the fact that you can play it with so many different uh, player counts, the fact that it plays in an hour makes it almost a super filler. I, it's not, not really, but like, there are oftentimes uh, uh, moments in um, uh, game nights where you'll have like five people or something like that and everyone's like, I could play one more game or maybe not. Then this is like a perfect game for that because it's only going to be an hour. The teach is not uh, very long either. I found you do have to go through quite a few examples, but I found I can teach this game in about 15 minutes, which isn't too bad. And that just means that it, it can just get to, uh, lodged into so many different moments. And that means that this game is likely going to get played a lot. Like this is likely going to be the... 
uh, end up being the most ga uh, played game for me of 2018. If I look back on this in a few years, that would not surprise me at all. In particular of the kind of medium uh, weight style games. You know, uh, there are lots of uh, very lightweight games that I could play a lot of like Railroad Inc. But um, I do think that Keyflow is going to keep hitting the table because it is so versatile. It's so fun as well. I just really enjoy the process of putting the stuff together. And I'm not even very good at this game. Uh, the last time I played was a five player game and I came dead last and I enjoyed every second of it. I, I was putting a thing together and I, I did a good job of it. Just my opponents did a better job of putting their things together than I did. And so even though I came dead last, I really enjoyed it. I have yet to win this game. I think I came in second once and I am looking forward to trying this more and uh, trying different strategies based off of the cards that come out each time and based off of the different winter cards I see at the very beginning of each round. I just think that Key Flow is a wonderful game. Um, honestly, it was my number one game for a while. And then I ended up thinking about it a little bit more and I ended up downgrading it kind of at the last minute. A few days ago, I decided to put it into the two slot. So um, that alone uh, tells you a lot about this game. Uh, being at number two is great. And the fact that it was a serious contender for one is also. So uh, I think I've talked about this one too much. So let's now talk about the final game on this list. And that one is Concordia Venus. Yes, that's right. An expansion to a game that came out four or so years ago is my number one game from 2018. And I don't want that to sound like a slight because this uh, expansion is amazing. And honestly, Concordia Venus turns Concordia into a completely different gaming experience. And that is the reason why I decided that putting it on this list of games made the most sense. Obviously, uh, in general, expansions kind of get relegated to other style lists. But what uh, Concordia Venus does is it adds partnership play to the game of Concordia. Now, if you're not familiar with Concordia, this game came out many years ago, and it is a brilliant game. It's honestly one of my favorite games anyway, so I was already predisposed to like this expansion. But uh, Concordia is a game where you have a hand of cards, and on your turn, you play one of them down in front of you, and then you read what the card does, you do what the card says it does, and then the next person takes their turn. The next time you have a turn, you have less cards in your hand, because that card that you played will stay out in front of yourself, and at a certain point, you play a specific card, the Tribune, to pull all of your cards back, and then you can play your cards again. Now, as you are playing Concordia, you are able to purchase new cards from a central tableau, and you add those right into your hand, and that means you are doing hand building as you're playing the game, trying to get uh, the right actions into your hand so that you can do multiple actions within a given round uh, before you have to spend a whole turn resetting everything back up. But then one of the most brilliant aspects to this game is the fact that at the bottom of every single card in this game is an end game victory point uh, multiplier, essentially. Uh, every single card has an action, but at the bottom, it might say something like this card in particular, that one card is worth one point for every non-brick city that you've built throughout this game. Or maybe this one card over here is worth two points for every colonist that you have at the end of the game. So what that means is as you are playing the game, you not only want to build your hand out with the cards that have actions that you want, but also that have the end game scoring multipliers that match up with the stuff that you have done. Now, that is the uh, quick uh, synopsis of how Concordia works. But when it uh, comes to Venus, you can now play a four player game with two teams of two, or you can play a six player game with three teams of two. And the way it works now is whenever it is your turn, you play a single card from your hand down onto the table, you do everything that the card says, and then your opponent who is across the table from you gets to do that action as well. Now the, the, the hitch to this game is that you are not technically allowed to talk with your uh, partner across the table, so they don't really know what's coming. And that means that as you are playing this game, you now not only need to consider what is good for me in this moment? What am I building up towards right now? But also, what is my partner trying to do over there? And were they uh, furiously trying to uh, uh, beam over to me with their eyes, trying to communicate uh, to me what it is that they actually want me to do? Because the best way to play Concordia Venus is to be as efficient as you can, where every single turn you, uh, you play an action that is best for you and your partner. Now, obviously, that means you do that turn, and then the next the people keep taking turns, and now your partner takes their turn, and you don't even know what they're going to play, and they're going to put something down, and suddenly you're like, holy cow, I'm doing an architect action this turn? Okay, let's see what I'm going to do. And hopefully, they've decided to do that because they looked over at your stuff, and they decided that you were in a good position to make use of that action. Now, when it comes to the partnership, all of your resources are your own. However, money is shared between you, which adds an interesting level of kind of tension between you and your partner because it's easy to sometimes play a little selfishly on accident just be playing Concordia just like do to do I do this I spend the money to do that and then you're like okay partner you do your turn too and they say you used all the money 
<laughs> so they can't really do something because you used all of that communal money, and that's important um, to try and pay attention to that. Um, now, in my several plays of this one now, I can say that I have never really seen that much actual tension between players. It's cropped up uh, once or twice, um, but in general, it's just such a fascinating puzzle of playing a game of Concordia, but then also playing a mind game of trying to be inside the head of your partner as you're trying to play things well. Because when the game is over, you effectively all score all of your points independently, and then you add your points to the points that your partner has, and that's going to be your final score. So just getting points for the both of you is fine. You don't have to try and balance things out between you. In fact, it might make sense to have one person score the vast majority of the points compared to the other one based off of how the game state went. Now, uh, when it comes to other aspects to Concordia Venus, there are new cards that come out on that card row that are specifically oriented around um, the partnership basis of this expansion. Uh, those cards have two actions on them. They might have like a Mercator and an Architect. And essentially that means the Mercator means you can uh, buy and sell resources and the Architect means you can move your colonists and you can build stuff out on the board. So now when you play that card, the person who plays it decides, do they want to be the Mercator or do they want to be the Architect? And then their partner across the table does the other thing. So now you can set up some really cool combos where it might be a situation where I have this card in my hand. I'm not in a great spot to actually architect, but my opponent obviously is. And they want to, uh, my, sorry, my partner obviously is. So I'll play this card down and maybe I will Mercator because we don't have that much money. So I will sell some stuff to make money into our communal pool that my partner can then use to actually do the architect action on their turn. Now things can get even wackier because in your starting hand, you have a card that is called the Legatus. And what this does is it lets you play it down and then you get to look at the cards that your uh, partner has and you suggest one of them for them to play, and then both of you do that card. So now you can also kind of play the cards that your partner has, and then when you add on to the fact that you have um, original Concordia type stuff like diplomacy, means you can have these bonkers situations. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, the diplomat lets you copy another card. So uh, one time we were playing the game where I put a Legatus down to look at my partner's cards, I suggested they play a Diplomat. They do. They ended up copying one of those uh, Architect slash uh, Prefect cards, which lets you get resources for whole regions of the zone to then do an Architect. So now we're getting all of these cards played with these wacky kind of bouncing around of actions, and it just these moments can be so satisfying when they work out really well for you. Now, at this point, I do need to mention the length of time it takes to play this game, because I know I talked about it at somewhat uh, significant length about Underwater Cities. Now, if you are sitting down to play a regular game of Concordia with no expansions, uh, from my experience, if everybody is familiar with Concordia, you could play a five-player game of this easily in 90 minutes, um, sometimes even less than that. Now, I have played two six-player games of this and one four-player game, and in those, uh, the first of those six-player games, every single person was experienced with Concordia. They played the game multiple times, and the game took about three and a half hours. So that is a huge uh, a multiplier. That's more than twice as long than that five-player game took to play. And when that first happened, I was like, well, maybe that's just, we were at a convention, and we were all new to it. So then I played another six-player game where all but one person was very familiar with Concordia. In fact, uh, several of the people in that play had already played Venus the prior time, and that game still took over three hours. Now, the next time after that, I played a four-player game, and that was easily a two-and-a-half-hour game. So what I'm saying here is that this expansion really makes the game a lot longer. I think it makes the game fascinating. I think it makes it significantly deeper. And I think that um, there's an argument to be made for me personally where I'm not sure if I'm ever going to play Concordia without Venus ever again because I have found the decisions to be made um, to be so fascinating. It's just such a fresh situation. Like how many partnership Euro games are there out there? It's very rare and this pulls it off so well. And the fact that it's built on the backbone of Concordia, which is a game I love, um, um, just adds uh, further credence to that. I have just been so excited about this game. I've talked uh, the ear off many people about it, and that's the reason why it's up here at the number one slot. But I, again, do have to preface this by saying that this is going to be a long game of Concordia. Like, if, if you're used to Concordia being 90 minutes and you like it being at 90 minutes, then maybe Venus is not necessarily going to be for you. But I can say that, uh, from my perspective, I've enjoyed essentially every second of those three and a half hour and two and a half hour games. Because it is a partnership-based game in a six-player game, you are still taking a turn every third action. And in that uh, four-player game with two teams of two, you're taking an action every other turn. So even though the game went long, we were just doing all sorts of stuff. Now, it is true that there can be a decent amount of downtime when uh, particular people are having a really hard time parsing what their partner actually wants. Uh, but overall, just the enjoyment that I've had has been worth it. And every time I've played this game, at least one person at some point while playing has exclaimed, holy cow, this is amazing. <laughs> like, just when it finally clicks, like, 
how all of these interactions work and how you're playing this card down and how they can bounce around and just all of those things to be thinking about. It's just felt so fresh and it's really won over all of us. And I am really looking forward to playing this game again uh, many more times. It's likely I'll play Concordia, the regular version at some point in the future, but uh, my emphasis is very much on the Venus aspect and I will look for opportunities to play six player games of this because wow, did that really work? I will look for opportunities to play this at four players, even though it might be a two and a half hour game because it's just been uh, such an exceptional, fresh, and fascinating new way to play a Euro game that I already loved. All right, we have now finally reached the end of this list, and I hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, I think it's very likely if you've made it all the way through here and looked at the overall list that I have maybe missed a game that you loved from 2018. Um, if you're curious why it's not on here, then feel free to comment down below about it. Uh, I can already kind of um, imagine some of them that people will mention. Uh, one in particular is probably going to be Teotihuacan. Um, that one I really liked when I first played it a couple times, but as I played it more and more, that game just really started to actively frustrate me with the, uh, the vast amount of bookkeeping that you had to do and uh, just getting nickeled and dimed when you're trying to pay for Coco to do a ton, a ton of different things. Um, I, I just kind of felt like it had one more track than it really needed. I feel like there was one of my favorite games ever inside of Teotihuacan, but um, that was not the game that was actually in the box. And other people love the game and that's fine. But for me, that was enough to knock it off the list because I'm not actually that interested in playing it anymore. Um, Pioneer Days was a game that I really liked the first time I played it, but then when I played it a second time, um, it just, I started to see a lot of kind of cracks in the design that I really didn't like, and we ended up having a pretty frustrating experience with it, so that one fell down uh, pretty quickly. Uh, Crown of Amara, I was very excited about when I played it at uh, Essen last year, but after playing it several more times, I now think that it is a fine game, but it's not as innovative and exciting as I was uh, as it originally seemed to me. And um, there are lots of other games that I considered, uh, like uh, Ganshin Clever, and many more that are not uh, directly in my head right now, but overall, I, I feel really confident about this list. I think that 2018 was a really good year for games. Like, the years are all um, excellent games on this list, and there are many uh, games that are excellent that are, are not on this list as well. I think that some really innovative, neat stuff came out um, in 2018, especially when it comes to uh, different action selection mechanisms um, uh, with uh, Scorpius Raider, as well as um, underwater cities with the way you matched up your workers along with the cards and others that I can't think of right now because man my brain is just falling out of my ears. I've been talking for a while, so I think at this point we should probably wrap this one up. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you can do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.